Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Fantasy Reaction Show. My name is Andrew Velez. I'm here with my co-host, Mr. Joel Dells. This is episode two of the 2024 NFL Fantasy Football Season. Mr. Dells, we got a great show ahead of us. How are you doing today? How are we feeling about this upcoming fantasy football season? Doing fantastic. Feels good to be back in my setup. I got a light here yet again. I watched the video back last time. I was like, damn, I look like shit. Uh, but show must go on sometimes. It was July 4th. Things were happening. Couldn't get the light in time. The light I did have, the battery was actually dead. So I have somewhat of an excuse. But feeling good, man. You know, we're going to do top 20 running backs today. Then we're going to get receivers and quarterbacks and everything like that down the line. I'm doing fantastic, though. Fantasy drafts are around the corner. We were just talking in our home league that we're setting up our date going to Atlantic City, as always, to draft with the guys. It's, it's the best day of the year, man. I can't wait. No, fantasy season really is one of one. That's just the God's honest truth. But honestly, I enjoy when we get into these rankings and, and we see which – where do we have our differencing of opinions? People like to say that you and I think alike too often. And where, honestly, some of that some of that has some validity. I, I saw our, our list. We're going to have some differencing of opinions. It should be a fun show. But let's get right into it. Mr. Dells, we, we had to up our production skills. And now I had to make sure that we can go and we can, can have a little bit of a graphic. And I'm pretty proud of myself. I'm going to be transparent with you. All right, can you see it as we as we are right now? Oh yeah, she's there. Oh, let's go. All right, so at number twenty, Mister Dallas, talk to us. Yes, sir. Number twenty, DeAndre Swift. Um, so what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna give my top, or I guess my bottom five, twenty to sixteen. Then Drew's gonna give his. Then we're gonna go back and forth here and discuss the differences as we go along. So DeAndre Swift, twentieth on my list. When we're going to talk about all of these players, again, we've talked about it before in the past. You have to put real-life expectations, real-life agendas to the side. Because I feel like DeAndre Swift gets hated on a lot. But this is a guy that got paid three years, $24 million in the offseason. This is a guy that was the first running back, one of the first players in free agency, if you might remember, to get paid. They didn't look at Josh Jacobs or Saquon or even a guy like Zach Moss for a lesser deal. They went right after DeAndre Swift. And there's really no other running back on this roster that I'm fearful of. Khalil Herbert had a couple of good games at the very last uh, month of the season there. Roshan Johnson, I liked coming out of college, but he wasn't someone that got a lot of work last season either. And I don't think either of those guys are really going to take away work from DeAndre Swift when it comes to the red zone or goal line opportunities. And in fantasy football, those are two of the most important things to have. Swift is going to be involved in two-minute drills and four-minute drills in the red zone. And he got paid this offseason to be the lead back on an offense I think most of us are expecting to be a top 15-ish offense. You have sure. DJ Moore and Keaton Allen going in the top five rounds of drafts, but you have DeAndre Swift going really late. So if this is a, a scenario where you punt on your RB2, you take a bunch of uh, wide receivers early or get a quarterback early or tight end, DeAndre Swift was your RB2. I think you do a lot worse. 19, David Montgomery. Um, it's not a sexy pick, but similar boat to DeAndre Swift. It, this is a guy that you could get later in the draft in like the seventh or eighth round when you could load up in other positions. And Jameer Gibbs, he's going to be high on both of our rankings, but sure. David Montgomery is going to be involved in this offense, even after returning from injury last season, right? Gibbs took over, um, you know, early in the year around week four or five, David Montgomery comes back from week 10, comes back in week 10 from injury. He was the RB 18 from week 10 on. So even though Gibbs was the number one there. Even though Gibbs was seeing more snaps, he was getting more carries, more involved in the passing game. David Montgomery still gave you multiple top 15 weeks. He scored a touchdown in seven of nine games to end the season. He's a touchdown dependent RB2, but this is going to be one of the best rushing offenses in the NFL. This is going to be one of the best offenses in the NFL, one of the best offensive lines in the NFL. So I'd be happy with David Montgomery as my RB2 there. Josh Jacobs at 18 here. This is probably the lowest in terms of like where ADP is compared to where I have a player. I'm not a big fan of Josh Jacobs this year. You know, he led the league in rushing a couple of years ago. Even after that, I was still a bit skeptical of him going to last season. Of course, he had the holdout situation. He didn't come into camp at 100% or really in shape. And, and that showed, you know, he averaged 3.5 yards per carry last season. The explosiveness was not there. Samir White was actually more efficient than him last year on the same Raiders team that everyone is saying had such a bad offensive line and quarterback. Samir White was better, and now he's changing teams, going to the Green Bay Packers. He got paid, but he kind of got like fake paid. It was basically a one-year deal disguised as a four-year deal. They drafted Marshawn Lloyd in day two. Um, A.J. Yep. Dillon is back, so I think this is going to be a running back by committee. Josh Jacobs is the one in this offense, but 
I just don't see enough explosiveness or big play ability from Josh Jacobs where he's going to be a guy that's probably going to get like 15 carries a week. If he gets a touchdown, you're happy. If he doesn't, he's probably disappointed. And the guy that's replacing him, um, or I guess the, the guy that used to be in Green Bay here, Aaron Jones at number 17. Aaron Jones, you can make, you can paint two pictures, right? Because on one side, he's a 29-year-old running back coming off an injury plague season, switching teams. Historically, that usually does not work out. But Aaron nope. Jones showed at the end of last season, he still has the juice. Last three weeks of the season, plus two weeks of the playoffs, he was averaging over 20 carries per game. He had five straight games of 100 plus rushing yards. I think the real only worry here is what does this Vikings offense look like? You have Sam Darnold slash JJ McCarthy under center for what we're expecting to be the majority of the season. But I feel really good about Kevin O'Connell. He's one of the better head coaches, in my opinion, in the NFL. And this is an offensive line that should be an above average offensive line in terms of uh, run run unit. Three of their five starters had a PFF run blocking grade of 65 or higher last season. I do think Ty Chandler is kind of sneaky in terms of being like a 1B there. Okay. I think over the last month or so of the season, once they let go of Alexander Madison, Ty Chandler showed that he could be serviceable you know, in, in the NFL and for the Minnesota Vikings. But Aaron Jones got a decent payday from them. And I think the explosiveness is still there. I think he'll still get used, uh, um, especially in the passing game around the red zone as well. And if he's able to stay healthy, which is obviously a big concern, if he's able to stay healthy, he has the upside because he has that explosiveness to be a top 10 running back. And lastly, he's going to be Kenneth Walker. Lastly, for my top five and Drew, or bottom five, and Drew again to his. Kenneth Walker, I feel like a lot of people are out on going into this season, but you have to remember what he looked like before the injury last year. He got banged up in week eight, but before that, he was consistently getting 60 plus percent of the running back snaps. Um, and the three weeks before his injury was his highest snap totals of the year, where he was approaching 70 to 80 percent of snaps um, on offense. He was the RB8 in points per game over that stretch, but once he got hurt, he was not the same dude. He never saw over 60% of snaps again over the last two to three months of the season. He missed multiple weeks. And Zach Charbonnet kind of became the 1A in this offense. But even though Charbonnet became the 1A in the offense, um, Kenneth Walker still outproduced him. He was still better running back True. in fantasy points per game than Charbonnet was last year. So I'm going to this season expecting Walker to be the RB1. I think Seattle wants to treat him like the RB1. And I think he's the more talented running back of the two. So if he's a guy that could get 15 to 20 carries each and every week, I think he's someone, again, if he could stay healthy, he has the talent to be a top 10 type back in fantasy. Yeah, I don't mind this 20 to 16, not even a little bit. I will say I do not have Kenneth Walker in my top 20. And I, I, I maybe I'm allowing the the second half of last season to cloud my judgment a lot with Kenneth Walker. But again, early in the season, he was looking like one of the best fantasy options. Second half of the season comes around, obviously is banged up a little bit, but then splitting the backfield with Zach Charbonnet, we saw his fantasy value get absolutely tanked. He's not an inefficient rusher. I think it was around 4.3 yards per carry, which isn't terrible. But at the same time, as a receiving back, doesn't really give you that, that much upside either. To me, Kenneth Walker, not not knowing the certainty of what's going to happen with this Seattle offense, I look at a couple other guys and I have them a little bit higher. So, yes, Kenny Walker would be the first of my honorable mention. I also will say DeAndre Swift is also an honorable mention of mine in the Chicago offense. He's going to be that that last cog that you're not really thinking of because DJ Moore, because of Keenan Allen. And, of course, Roma Dunze is going to be there. And, and Caleb might even sprinkle a little bit of mobility in that too. But DeAndre Swift behind a respectable offensive line. He should have himself a solid ball, uh, a solid season for sure. But let's start off at number 20. Mine's going to be James Conner. I think James Conner is a guy that's gotten severely underrated as he's as his career has gone on in Arizona. A lot of that has been due to injury. Last two seasons has played 13 games in both of them. But if you had James Conner towards the end of the season, he essentially won you won you your fantasy football league. We're talking about a guy who in 13 games rushed for over a thousand yards, was able to average over five yards per carry, had nine total touchdowns. And again, down the stretch of the season, he was a league winner. Now you add Marvin Harrison into this offense next to a Trey McBride. This offense with Kyler Murray at the helm is going to be so explosive that so long as James Conner is going to stay healthy, to me, we're talking about a top 20 finish for sure. Next on my list, number 19, Josh Jacobs. Joel, I'm in a similar boat with you. I know that Josh Jacobs, when he's at 100%, 
is a great talent. There was a list that recently was released saying that Josh Jacobs, the top 10 running back that I feel like is his, his ceiling right now. I don't know if anything higher than that can be in discussion, but in fantasy football in an offense where you have a, fr- a solid offensive front in front of you. If you're Josh Jacobs with the Green Bay Packers, Jordan Love took a huge stride in his game last year in his first year starting. Jaden Reed, Christian Watson, uh, you, uh, Romeo Dobbs, Dontavian Wicks, Luke Musgraves. There's so many mouths to feed, but of course, in the run game, Josh Jacobs should be their RB1. But like you mentioned, I do believe it will be a running back by committee, but we'll see as the season goes on. I believe that when it's playoff time, they'll stick to the hot hand. That should be Josh Jacobs because Aaron Jones, to close out the season from week 16 to the second round of the playoffs, was one of the best players, period. And if I'm not mistaken, yeah, Aaron Jones comes in at number 18 for me. Aaron Jones was un. Believable and truthfully was one of the best players in football from week 16 on. Didn't have less than 100 yards, if I'm not mistaken, in every single game from week 16 on. Was insanely dominant, was getting into the end zone. The only knock against Aaron Jones is staying on the football field. He dealt with that hamstring injury essentially all year long, and that really tarnished what was an excellent end to a 2023 campaign. But in a Minnesota offense with Kevin O'Connell, the only issue, of course, is what What's going to happen with Sam Darnold? Is Sam Darnold going to be a good running, uh, a good quarterback? You have Jettas, you have Jordan Addison. Whenever Hawkinson does come back, that's an obvious plus to the offense. If Aaron Jones can stay healthy, I do believe that he is a top 20 running back. Number 17 is going to be Dave Montgomery. There's an argument to be made that he could have been higher after last season being around a top 13 fantasy finish, getting into the end zone as much as he did. If I'm not mistaken, 12 touchdowns. If but at the same 13 rushing touchdowns, excuse me, eclipsed over a thousand rushing was pretty efficient with those touches around 4.6 a carry. The only issue is, of course, we know he has a better running back in that backfield next to him in Jameer Gibbs. And Jameer Gibbs was a touchdown machine himself while also getting high usage in the passing game. But near the goal line, they do trust David Montgomery. I still expect him to be fantasy relevant regardless because of this Lions offense. Everything about it is super high powered, the best offensive line in football and great weapons alongside of these guys. But I still think that David Montgomery is one of the better value picks late in drafts. And number 16, you didn't have him on your list. And I understand that, but I have to show respect to Nick Chubb. And honestly, this is a guy that we could be looking at and think, man, Were we really, really this wrong about him? And I understand the injuries. That is the biggest scare of evaluating Nick Chubb. But right now, things are looking to plan. He's running full speed in a straight line. Right now, they're still working on lateral quickness. But if Nick Chubb is at 100% by week three, week four, we, we still could be talking about a top 10 running back in fantasy football. If he's able to be ready by week one, this number 16 evaluation can be some of the most wrong I have on my list. But again, I feel like playing it safe. I still think Nick Chubb will be ready earlier in the season than I think people anticipate. But at the same time, if he's ready to go, this is a top 20 locked running back for sure. Yeah, and Nick Chubb is someone who I would have as an honorable mention. James Conner as well. Those are two guys that would be within my top 24 Nick Chubb, I'm just waiting to see. I'm waiting Fair for enough. training camp to come around. I'm waiting for preseason to come around and just to, to see where the reports are. You know, thankfully, we have probably another six weeks, seven weeks or so until most people are, are using their fantasy drafts. And hopefully by then we'll have a better understanding of where Nick Chubb is. Because if the Browns, the fancy come out and says he's ready for week one, yeah, he shoots up this rankings and he's probably in my top 15. Um, but of course, a, a really, a really bad leg injury last season. I just want to wait and see. So if I was drafting today, I'd be taking those guys above, above uh, Chubb. Um, but yeah, we could go ahead and go into my number 15 running back, Joe Mixon. Mixon feels just incredibly safe this season going over to the Houston Texans. Of course, they trade for him. It was only a seventh round pick, but he was going to get cut. So Houston says, we want him. We want him to be the RB1. And Damian Pierce last year was a bit of a disaster. He was not efficient. Um, he, he lost his job at one point in the season. That's how inefficient he was. And this is going to be a super high-powered offense that is going to consistently be in scoring position. We know Joe Mixon can take on a whole bunch of carries last year. He had the fifth most carries and second most goal line carries amongst all running backs in the NFL. To me, as long as he's able to stay healthy, his his usage and his workload by itself should make him a top 15 running back. Um, but moving on to number 14 here, uh, this is where I have Alvin Kamara. 
I think how I feel about Kamara is how you feel about Nick Chubb. Kamara, to me, feels like the biggest deal possibly at the running back position. Last year, do you know where he was in running back points per game after coming back from suspension? Uh, if I had to guess, he's number five. He is RB6 last year ah. once he returned from suspension. He had the second most targets and the most receptions of any running back in the NFL. And that's with him missing the first three weeks he's of the year. Dog. He was used at the goal line. And even though the Saints are making a change at offensive coordinator, they're bringing in the San Francisco style of offense, that isn't going to change Derek Carr from just dumping the ball off to Alvin Kamara. They have Chris Alave there, Rashid Shahid, but Alvin Kamara is probably going to get the second most targets on this team. Nine of his 13 weeks, he was a top 15 running back. And I understand the age clip. The age clip is approaching. He's about to be 30 years old. He was a bit inefficient. But similar to how we're talking about Joe Mixon and some of these guys behind him, there's just not a lot of running backs on this roster I worry about. Kendra Miller was someone they took in day two last year. But reports out of minicamp was that he might have taken a step back, which I don't know how you do in the offseason, um, but somehow that happened. And then you have Jamal Williams there, who's just a backup. But in terms of just what actual production you're going to get from this guy, I wouldn't be surprised if Kamara is a top 10 running back this year just because receptions and targets are so valuable if you're in a half point or full point PPR league. 13, this is where I have James Cook. Once Joe Brady took over in week 11, James Cook was the RB11 in points per game. He was 10th in carries over that stretch, had multiple games of 40 plus receiving yards. He was seeing three to four targets per game, and he showed the ability to have these big rushing games as well, like he went for 180 yards against the Dallas Cowboys. I think the only drawback for James Cook is just at the goal line, he was not used at all. He only had five carries within the five-yard line. That was less than guys like Royce Freeman and Roshan Johnson, who like barely even had roles for the offense for majority of the season. But the Bills are going to be so high-powered that I don't think it's going to matter too much. And he also has the ability to score touchdowns from the 10-yard line, from the 20-yard line, to rip off a 40 or 50-yard touchdown. So I think with uh, Joe Brady taking over full-time, James Cook is sneaking kind of that back-end RB1 role. At 12, this is really the toughest spot for me, or toughest player to evaluate. It's going to be Devon HN. Um, I, I still don't know if 12 is too high or too low for him because he has the highest upside, in my opinion, out of anyone outside the top five because he had 60 points this past year against the Denver Broncos. But then he also has multiple injuries that sustained just in his rookie year. I think when you're drafting Devon HN, you really have to consider how the rest of your team is built. Are you drafting him to be your RB1? Because if you are, you're taking on a lot of risk there. This is a guy that, again, any given week can win you a week, but he also can play 30% of snaps, get banged up in the second quarter, and doesn't come back. And then once he's out for two weeks, do you play him that third week when he's coming off the injury? You don't know if he's going to play 40% of snaps or maybe 60% of snaps or maybe 10% of snaps. So there's just a lot of questions with HN, but the talent, the explosiveness, it, it's impossible to miss. He's the biggest boomer bust player on this list for me. And while I'm in drafts, when I'm doing these mocks, sometimes it's difficult for me to draft him because I look at my team and I'm like, I just want other guys like number 11, Rashad White, who is just the true definition of a workhorse. He had the most snaps of any running back in 2023, the third most carries, the ninth most targets. He hasn't missed a game in his career. 10 of 17 weeks, he was in the top 15. He's probably not going to be efficient enough or explosive enough to be a top five running back when you're talking about guys like Jameer Gibbs and, and B. John Robinson, who we're going to talk about later down the line. But in terms of someone that you could plug into your RB1 or your RB2, I think ideally, if he's your RB2, you're sitting very pretty. And he's going to, once again, probably be top five in targets, top 10 in targets, excuse me, one of the, amongst the, the league leaders in terms of snaps. All they brought in this offseason was Bucky Irving. That's not someone who really worries me. There's no one else on that roster. So Rashad White is just in line for another huge season volume-wise. Disrespecting my brother, James Cook. Come on, man. 13 is disrespectful. 13. What are we doing? <laughs> that being said, let's get into my 15 to number 11. You hit it right in the nose of 15. Joe Mixon last year was one of the sneakiest, what, top six, top seven running backs in fantasy football. I feel a lot of that was due to situation. Jake Browning was in at quarterback. He still was able to rush for a thousand yards. I'll give him his respect there. But the volume that he saw as a receiving back was huge for me. 52 catches. 
I just don't know if in this Texans offense with as many mouths to feed as there are, Nico Collins, Stephon Diggs, you have Tank Dell coming back from injury. Dalton Schultz is another guy that you have to look at to, to steal some opportunity. I'm just not sure how much he's going to be as used or in comparison to these other guys, because Devin Singletary was still a respectable fantasy option last season. If you needed a flex or you needed a, if you went through a crazy amount of injuries and you had to throw in Devin Singletary as your RB two, not great, but not the worst option. I'm not going to say he's going to be Devin Singletary. He's better than him, obviously. But again, there's so many mouths to feed. There's so many great guys in the league right now that I feel like 15 is a fair placement. Number 14, I feel like this is where I could say I may be slighted a player. But at the same time, I look at 14 for Isaiah Pacheco as, as a floor. This is one of the safest fantasy options that there are. He's behind one of the better O-lines in Kansas City. He did He did. He was effective as a as a touchdown guy. You are behind you are next to Patrick Mahomes, but efficiency wise, 4.6 a carry. Again, there's really no better situation in an offense where all the attention is going to be on Mahomes and behind this great offensive line. Pacheco has the opportunity as as a receiving back also, but obviously near goal line to get those opportunities. I really like Pacheco this season. Number 13, Alvin Kamara. Again, similar boat as you. Reception legend. 75 receptions last season, and you missed the first three games. He's a nutcase. He's a one-of-one -one fantasy option, especially when you understand he's never rushed for a 1,000 yards. Never rushed for a 1,000 yards. But because he's so effective as a receiving back, we constantly, every single fantasy football season, put respect on his name, and rightfully so. Number 12, Rashad White. Now, this has been a guy that I've really liked, especially coming out of college. But my issue with him is that, one, Dave Canales is no longer with the offense. Now it's Liam Cohen as the guy calling plays. How is he going to look as a rusher this season? Yes, their offensive line did improve as they did just gra uh, draft a bar Barham, if I'm not mistaken, out of Duke. I may be mispronouncing his name. But the, you, they need an interior offensive lineman. They go and they address that in the draft. He has been an inefficient rusher up until this point. But as a receiving back, there are, again, very few reliable guys like a Rashad White. And like Joe mentioned already, he is a workhorse. He is going to be the running back that is used more often than not on this Tampa Bay roster. So, of course, I do like his floor a lot here. And number 11, it's Travis Etienne. This guy is a weird player for me to evaluate more so than anyone else because the touchdown volume that he had was a strong reason why he was a top three finish last year. He was, of course, able to rush for over a thousand yards, but it was a very efficient, very efficient, inefficient season for him as he just rushed for 3.9 yards a carry. So if there is a touchdown regression, if the offensive line gets banged up and obviously they tried to make improvements to it this offseason, if it doesn't go into it to, as planned, I don't know if we're going to see Travis Etienne get carried by the level of touchdowns that he did have this past season. And I still think that he can be. He does have the ceiling of being a top 10 running back, in my opinion. But again, I do worry about the touchdown regression with with Travis Etienne. Yeah, that's fair. Um, we can get into the top 10 here because I have a couple of the guys that you just listed. Um, so number 10, Isaiah Pacheco. And this is where we can, I think, talk uh, a little bit back and forth. Isaiah Pacheco to me, I think he's in. I think he's in line for a bigger workload this upcoming season than he did last season, right? Because okay. if you look outside, or if you look um, at the beginning of last season, the first two or three weeks, right, he really wasn't utilized in this offense a ton. I mean, he was getting like nine to eleven carries. Um, he wasn't the you know fifteen plus carry type of guy that we saw kind of at the end of the year, right? The first two weeks sure. he was averaging twelve opportunities per game. Um, but then once you get past those first couple of weeks, he was a guy that was used in this offense kind of in a workhorse role. I, I don't think it's completely workhorse because he wasn't really seen like 70, uh, 70 percent of snaps that we see from a lot of traditional guys that were labeling workhorses. But the Chiefs didn't add anyone in the draft or free agency. All they have back there is Clyde Edwards Alaire. Pacheco to me Your is guy. by far and away the best running back on this roster. And when you have an offense that has Patrick Mahomes, when you have an offense, I think we're expecting to at minimum be top 10, if not possibly in the top five, I think he's going to have a ton of opportunity last season. And he finished as the RB 15 last year. That was only with nine touchdowns. And you're talking about uh, regression with the guy in Travis Etienne. I think this is someone in Pacheco who could have positive regression where 
nine touchdowns feels a little low for him. Like in this Chiefs offense that's going to score a ton, only nine total touchdowns, that could be easily double digits where we could possibly see 10 rushing touchdowns, three on the ground. And all of a sudden, instead of being RB15 last year, he was RB8. So I think going into this season, he's someone who can average about 15 to 20 opportunities per game. And once we get into that goal line situation, he's going to be able to convert on them. Going into gonna... our... oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I Talk just. I think Pacheco is obviously a great option this fantasy season, no doubt about it. I hear what you're saying about the touchdowns. I just look at the early parts of the season. He wasn't utilized as a receiver or receiving back as much as we saw, of course, later on in the season, of course, in the playoffs. If he can really start to incorporate that in his game, then my projection can be off. And we are talking about a top 10 fantasy option. But again, I have to see how they decide to move forward because in years past, we saw them run a Jarek McKinnon with a Clyde Edwards-Alaire. You mentioned how Clyde Edwards-Alaire is, is still with him. We saw Clyde Edwards-Alaire snag some touchdowns away from Isaiah Pacheco. If they come in with the mindset, this is our true workhorse, then again, I, I feel like a top 10 placement is fair. But again, going off of what history has shown me with Kansas City, I have to wait and see with that. Yeah, I think that's fair. Just looking at Clyde last season, kind of end of season snaps, um, week 14, 48% of snaps, week 15, 62% of snaps. Other than that, he never saw more than 40% of snaps. Um, and that was with McKinnon on the roster, although he was banged up, I believe, and it wasn't was. really utilized in this offense a ton. But Pacheco, after the first two weeks of the season, as I mentioned, only getting 12 opportunities per game, he was the RB9 in terms of fantasy points per game. Nine in 12 weeks, 15 or more carries. In the playoffs, he was getting like 20 carries a week. So I think especially down the stretch in the playoffs, they were really leaning on him. It's possible that early on in the season, maybe he gets eased in a bit more because they know we're going to have to rely on him down the stretch. But I just feel so comfortable in him being the clear RB1 in this team. Obviously, you do too. Um, yeah. That when you have a team that could score so much and has Patrick Mahomes on the roster, uh, give me the running back there. But moving on to, to nine here, Travis Etienne. You had him at 11, I have him at nine, so a bit higher. The workload for ETN just feels super safe. It's similar, in my opinion, to Rashad White, where neither of these players were super efficient, but these players are just getting so much work that it doesn't really matter if they're efficient. He had the fourth most carries in the league last season, but as you mentioned, it was a tale of two halves for ETN last year. Weeks one through eight, he averaged 19 carries for 73 yards and a touchdown per game. He was the RB4 over that stretch. Weeks 10 through 18, the opportunities came down, the touchdowns came down, and he, over that stretch, was the RB22. So he came, he he ended up, or he started as a guy who was a top five running back, an absolute must start to a guy second half of the year where you can't sit him because he was dominating for you for the first eight, nine weeks of the season. But nice. then towards the back half, you might have had a guy that you picked up off of waivers or traded for that you kept putting on your bench because ETN was just so damn dominant. Um, I think he'll finish somewhere in between four and 22 this year, but there is not a lot of guys that, are going to be top five in carries, obviously, five guys. So the fact that he was fourth last year and they didn't bring in, again, really any sort of competition. Tank Bigsby, they drafted last year. He was a disaster for them. There's really no way around that. But just given his opportunity alone, he, for me, is pretty comfortably within the top 10. Moving on to number eight, this is where I have Derrick Henry. And once we see your list, we could talk about Derrick Henry a bit more because you have him a bit higher yeah, than me. Um, I love Derrick Henry this year. You are in love with Derrick Henry this year. This is a workhorse running back going to one of the run heaviest teams in the NFL, of course, with the Baltimore Ravens. And it just gets me going to think about what Gus Edwards was in this offense and what Derrick Henry can become. Gus Edwards, in terms of what the usage he was getting, right? He had the most carries within the five yard line. He had 23 carries, had 12 touchdowns off of those, six most carries within the 10, seventh most carries within the 15. We talked about this previously, I think maybe even during our mock draft last time that, or maybe it was just on the regular show with pick aside, um, that Lamar Jackson isn't utilized around the red zone like Andy Richardson is or like Jalen Hurts is. They like giving the ball to running backs and they've been giving it to Gus Edwards too. In my opinion, he's an average running back. You know, he's averaging or he's approaching age 30. He could even be a bit below average. This was his least efficient season. Um, but Derrick Henry is a dude that is going to basically be a lock for double digit rushing touchdowns. And he still has an upside to give you 150 rushing yards any given week. So love Derrick Henry this season. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if he's a top five type of dude. Number seven, this is where I have Saquon Barkley. Um, 
this is the best offense he's ever been a part of, best offensive line, best quarterback. And before the Respect Eagles Daniel. season went to shit last year, right, before that week 13 against San Francisco, DeAndre Swift was seeing nearly 20 opportunities per game when he took at carries and targets last year. Um, he was fifth in carries within the top five, excuse me, within the 10 yard line. He was getting the volume to be a top five type of running back. But again, the second half of the year happened. His numbers completely went down. But now Saquon gets to take over that role where he's getting nearly 20 opportunities. He's getting looks around the red zone. I think the only question mark a lot of people have is twofold is just one. When you do get, you know, into that five yard line, because that's where Swift kind of fell off in terms of carries. We know what the Eagles love to do. It's the tush push. Bonkers. And then Jalen Hurts just looking uh, just in terms of dump offs, in terms of targets, doesn't utilize running backs as highly, um, especially when you compare it to like Daniel Jones and Eli Manning when he had him, uh, you know, his rookie season. And then lastly here, six, Jonathan Taylor. Um, this is the guy I had a bit higher and then I moved him down a bit for another player. JT has burned people, myself included, two years in a row. <laughs> right. You know, going into the bat the last two seasons, this is a guy that was drafted as a top two to three running back in fantasy football. And not only that, but we don't really know what he's going to look like with Anthony, Anthony Richardson. You know, Richardson can take away touchdowns and red zone touches for him. We didn't really get much of a sample of what this offense is going to look like with Anthony Richardson and a workhorse running back. Richardson yeah. was healthy for two full weeks this year. Week one, if you remember, was the Deion Jackson week because uh, Zach Moss was coming off like a broken forearm, I believe. And yep. the only other week, I believe, was week three or week four. I forgot which week Anthony Richardson was healthy. Zach Moss had 18 carries, four carries in the red zone. So there's not really a ton to go off of that we could project what Jonathan Taylor will be. This is a dude that got paid last year. This is a dude that we know when he's healthy. He's one of the most explosive, efficient, just overall best running backs. And the NFL, there's no doubt in my mind that he's going to get his opportunities. But when you're talking about a guy in the top six and the top five, you have to get the most opportunities. You have to consistently get 20 touches. You have to consistently get looks within the five-yard line. And that's just the slight hesitation I have with Jonathan Taylor this year. Yeah, you'll see very shortly that uh, you and I have a strong, similar opinion in that regard. But 10 to 6 here. Let's get into the nitty-gritty of, of our of our list. Number 10, James Cook. Only three spots different than yours, of course, so it wasn't too much disrespect. But I look at a guy like James Cook, and last year was uber efficient on the ground. 4.7 a carry. Did rush for over 1,100 yards. 1,500 total scrimmage yards. He was sensational. Was a top 11 guy in fantasy football last year at the running back position. If he can work on his hands and become a respectable receiving option where he's already getting volume. He just needs to secure a secure some more balls. Take that as you will. And he will be one of the best fantasy options that we do have in this game, especially in this offense where it's lacking superstar talent. And James Cook has the potential to be a star in this offense. But you're right, the goal line opportunities do worry me. But again, he's seeing so much volume in terms of just touches alone that I have a very strong feeling that we're going to be in for a great James Cook season and even more so a breakout than last year. Number nine, Devon Achan. Now, you and I, pretty similar. You have him at 12. I have him at nine. I'm a little bit higher than him, a little bit higher on him than you are. But a lot of it is due to the fact of we saw five games where he had over 25 fantasy points. He was averaging an unsustainable almost eight yards a carry on the ground. He rushed for, I believe, what, not almost 900 yards in his, and I think it was eight touchdowns in 11 games, 900 rushing yards in 11 games also. We were talking about an unbelievable showing from Devon Achan. The issue was, again, he only played 11 games. He has to stay on the football field, but if he were to be able to stay on the football field for 17, 15 to 17 games, number nine is going to be where he's going to be at. He's an explosive explosive running back option, and I know most are still in the backfield. We still have to pay respect to the, the guy who was tied for most touchdowns at the running back position with CMC, but he is such an explosive player. I find myself naturally gravitating towards HN, and he falls at number nine. Number eight, maybe this is a little bit low, but I'm going with Jameer Gibbs. I see number 17, and I respect that guy too much. I think that he will steal some opportunity away from Jameer Gibbs, but we saw in that second half of the season, this was Jameer Gibbs' squad, especially in the playoffs, unfortunately, against San Francisco where he fumbles the ball. He was still having himself an, a great game up until that point, which, which obviously was devastating if you are a Lions fan. But Jameer Gibbs, 
is a special talent, an elite rusher, an elite pass catcher at the running back position. He essentially can do it all, is behind the best offensive line in football. Jameer Gibbs, top eight, stamp that, no doubt about it. Number seven, this one I struggle with between seven and six. Kyron Williams is one of my favorite guys in, in, in the National Football League at the running back position. You miss five games. You're still able to get into the end zone 15 times. You have thirteen over 1,300 scrimmage yards. This guy is a t- potential top five guy, but again, the injuries is what's kind of holding me back and putting him at number seven. I know they just drafted Blake Corum. To me, that's not really hindering my my thoughts on Kyron. Again, more so, are you going to be able to stay on the field consistently? Because we already saw in OTAs and training camp that you that he did pick up an injury. But he's obviously cleared now. He's good to go, has a full bill of health. But again, Kyron Williams is an amazing talent. And if he's 100% ready, then then this top seven lock is guaranteed to me. Uh, Number six, Jonathan Taylor. You hit a lot of the, the points on the head perfectly. JT, three years ago, was the best running back in football. Rushed for over 1,800 yards, was just one of the mo- had one of the most dominating fantasy seasons that we've seen, but in the last couple of seasons has struggled to stay on the football field. Last year did pick up late in the season, a torn right ligament, a torn ligament in his right thumb. And when we did see him on, obviously Jonathan Taylor did have some strong performances, but again, it's the injuries that worry us with Jonathan Taylor. When he's on the football field, the talent's undeniable. He is still one of the best running backs in the game, probably a top six, top five running back in regular football. When it comes to fantasy, you mentioned Anthony Richardson. We haven't seen the two together on the football field at the same time. In theory, this should be one of the most explosive, one of the most fun running back or one of the most most fun offenses to watch in general, period. If Jonathan Taylor were to stay healthy, we will finally see him get back to that mountaintop and be in con- in contention for that top spot. But for right now, I like the guys ahead of him that I do have, but that's going to round out our 22-6. So to recap, my 20-15, to 20-16, to 16, I have James Conner, Josh Jacobs, Aaron Jones, David Montgomery, Nick Chubb. From 15 to 11, I have Joe Mixon, Isaiah Pacheco, Alvin Kamara, Rashad White, Travis Etienne, and from 10 to 6, I'm, I got James Cook, Devon Achan, Jameer Gibbs, Kyron Williams, and Jonathan Taylor. So when you're in drafts, just out of curiosity, does – because I'm just going to stick on the Achan point here because okay. I feel like he's one of the more unique players. You have him above guys like Etienne, Rashad White, uh, even James Cook. Their workload to me is so guaranteed. Their workload, especially when we're talking about Rashad White and Travis Etienne, these are dudes that are probably going to be top five in carries. How do you manage between the guaranteed workload that you're getting from those guys that you know every given week they're probably going to see 20 opportunities compared to Achan, who might only get 10 opportunities a week. To be fair, he might only need eight opportunities to go off for 40. But you know the downside to the injury history. Um, Of course, having Raheem Mostert there who are around the goal line, maybe he gets more work than him. I just have a hard time putting him above guys that I know week in and week out are just going to be workhorses. And I understand that thought process. Again, when it comes to fantasy football, you want the player that's on your team on the field more often than not, of course. But in situations like this where Devon Achan is just a big play waiting to happen, and we saw it in multiple instances where five games – we, we can see him take one at the 25 all the way to the end zone. He just has that big playability as a rusher, super efficient on the ground. Again, in limited opportunity, he is able to capitalize on that. And I, I'm pretty sure the Dolphins feel the exact way that I feel. If we have a, a, a talent that is very special, one of one in his ability to have breakaway speed, have great vision, have ability to, to break tackles and, and separate away from defenders. I look at guys like Rashad White and Travis Etienne that aren't nearly as efficient as as a Devon Achan, aren't in offenses as explosive as the Miami Dolphins. So to me, sometimes going upside is beneficial to your squad. And I understand that there is the injury concern with Devon Achan, and maybe I'm out gambling a little bit, but if we're being honest, that's kind of what fantasy football is. You really like to go up on upside a good amount of time, and there is really – a great gamble, a great risk, and high reward with Devon HN this season. And if you just want to have fun for fantasy, if you like watching your favorite players, I get it. You know, HN is arguably the most fun player to watch in the NFL. And it's crazy because even the same dude on his team and Tyree Kill is still there. 
Um, so yeah, just to real quick, uh, I won't go over my top 20, but just so everyone knows, just a couple, I say the biggest discrepancies, when we look really in the top 15, because like 16 to 20, I think we can make arguments for a bunch of different guys. Yeah. Um, I'm higher on Isaiah Pacheco. I have him at 10. Drew has him at 14. Um, Drew is higher on James Cook. He has him at 10. I have him at 13. And he's higher on HN. He has him at 9. I have him at 12. But other than that, most of our guys are within a couple spots of each other. For sure. Um, I guess the other guy, though, we can get into our top five here. Our biggest difference um, is going to be Derek Henry, but I'll go ahead and give my top five first. So at number five here, Kyron Williams. Um, at first, I had him like eight, eight or nine. Or I just did like a quick preliminary, just one through 20. Let me just get all my thoughts out and then kind of research and go from here. But the more I dug into him, the more I looked at last season, it was really difficult for me to put him without our with without it with not inside my top five. He was the RB two in points per game last season. He ended the season with five straight games of twenty plus carries. You mentioned Blake Corum when you talked about Kyron Williams. It, it doesn't move me. It really doesn't nope. move me one inch. I know you're a Michigan guy. You know, don't want to disrespect you or Love anything him. like no. that. But irrelevant. He's irrelevant. Irrelevant. <laughs> um, when I think of running backs drafted on day two who got drafted to the Rams, I think of just a few years ago. Daryl Henderson was drafted in 2019. Todd Gurley was there, and it looked like Daryl Henderson was going to have an impact possibly. This was this was Todd Gurley coming off Todd Gurley type season right in 2018. In that year, though, Daryl Henderson had 39 attempts in 13 games. He was not utilizing the offense at all. Malcolm Brown actually had more opportunities than him in that season. And Sean McVay, the one thing we know about him, he wants an RB1. He wants a workhorse. We saw Daryl Henderson get picked off up the street, got 18 carries in some random week, then got cut back to the street. He <laughs> wants a guy to be the RB1, to get 20 touches, to be out there to 70 to 80% of snaps. And Kyron Williams can handle that. I know the injury history is there, but he could also make special shit happen. I mean, this was a guy that had 100 plus rushing yards in half of his games last year. This is a guy that even when he got banged up, right? He got injured because I actually just pulled up his uh, his player card here. He got banged up in week seven. He missed week seven to 11. He came back in week 12 and was the RB1 on the week, only playing 61% of snaps, had 143 rushing yards, 60 receiving yards, and two touchdowns. It's really difficult for me, even when I look at these guys in the top four that I love so much that there's a legit argument outside of probably CMC at number one that he could be as high as number two. But I think it's just the injury history that we're baking in here a bit. Moving on to number four, and this is one of our bigger discrepancies here, is Jameer Gibbs. Back. Gibbs last season, first five, six weeks of the year, David Montgomery and him were splitting carries. Montgomery is probably getting a bit more work if you look at it closely. But once he took over that RB1 spot, he was the guy. Week seven on, he was the RB3. And I think the only question about him is really just his touches, right? Because when you think about workhorses, Kyrie Williams, Bijan, Brees Hall, CMC, these dudes that some weeks get 25 to 30 opportunities per game, Jameer Gibbs probably won't get that. But I don't think he really needs that. I think he needs 15 to 20 touches at max. When you look at last season, I mean, week seven, he had 20 touches. He was the RB3. Week 10, he had 17 touches. He was the RB2. Week 15, he had 13 touches, played less than 50% of snaps. He was the RB3. He's so explosive, so efficient, great in the passing game, great between the tackles, great on the outside. I think really the only concern is just when it comes to the red zone, David Montgomery might get used more there. But Jameer Gibbs, similar to Achan or James Cook, who we have questions about when it comes to goal line usage, he's just so special outside the goal line that he could take 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 yard touchdowns to the end zone. So Gibbs to me last year was one of the best running backs in football going into year two. I think his opportunities are going to increase, even though David Montgomery is still going to have a huge role in this offense. And the top three here. Um, I really want to get mad any order you had it. I think Back. CMC being number one, he's the only dude I didn't have a single note on this whole list. It's CMC. <laughs> there, there's nothing to say about CMC. But between two and three and Brees and Bijan Robinson, it's really close. Um, I had Brees at number two because he was RB2 last year coming off a torn ACL, right? Uh, that Whoa. week one, uh, he Dalvin Cook was used a bunch. Even the first like month or so of the season, Dalvin Cook was used way too much in this offense. The offensive line, quarterback play, offense, red zone opportunity should all be greatly improved for this New York Jets team. Brees only had 22 red zone carries last season, which is just insane to think about. That was outside the top 30 when you look at all running backs in the NFL. He's a guy that should be getting double-digit rushing touchdowns, and he has insane receiving upside, insane big playability. He's going to be the number one, obviously, on this Jets team, even though I like Braylon 
found a lot to be the RB2 for the Jets. Number three, B. John Robinson. Um, top 10 running back as a rookie in what felt like a bit of a lost year. He still had five finishes within the top 10, so he was giving you that upside, although Arthur Smith was doing his best to, to, to make that more difficult for us. And three of those uh, three of those top 10 finishes came in the last five weeks of the year. So I think as the season came, uh, as the season progressed, he gained more trust in Arthur Smith. He shouldn't have to gain that trust. He should have just had it because he was taking the top 10. But as the season went on, he got better and better. And this is a team that should see increased quarterback play and a coaching staff who wants to get him more involved. He's already been compared to Christian McCaffrey um, in this offense. So Bijan Robinson at number three. Uh, I love all five of these guys, obviously, and they all have the ability really to be the RB1 this year. To be honest, your top five is attractive. Your top three, I'm just going to spoil it right now, of course. We got the same top three in the exact same order. The only difference is Derrick Henry at five, Saquon Barkley at four. I look at Derrick Henry, and in a down year where he averaged 4.1 a carry, was still a top six, top seven running back in fantasy football, was able to get into the end zone 12 times. And now you're telling me he enters an offense next to Lamar Jackson, who we just saw. Gus Edwards have double digit touchdowns and we understand Gus Edwards where however you feel about Gus Edwards, that is not my problem. He's not Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry is one of the greatest running backs to ever touch a football field. And now he's in one of the best rush offenses in the national football league. Not as good of an offensive line as last year's Baltimore Ravens team, but nevertheless, it's much improved off what he had in Tennessee these last couple of years. And honestly, since AJ Brown has left, Tennessee has failed to put him in a position to succeed. It's the complete opposite now in Baltimore. This is going to be so much fun to watch, and I'm excited for the King to remind everyone who the true King is. Number four, Saquon Barkley. This is my guy this season. This is a guy that I'm trying my hardest to get on my team as much as I possibly can in the Philadelphia Eagles offense where, of course, we're talking about a top two rush offense. We're talking about a top three offensive line in football. We're talking about a situation where this has probably the most talent at the sk at, on skill positions probably in the National Football League with A.J. Brown. You have Devonta Smith, Dallas Goddard, of course, Saquon Barkley. This is going to be must-watch every single Sunday. If they play on Thursdays, if they play on Mondays, he's going to be uber-efficient. He just has to stay healthy. That's maybe the only question. But again, he's going to be protected so much by this Philadelphia Eagles offense that I fully anticipate he's going to be amazing. We saw DeAndre Swift have have – a, a very respectable season last year. We saw Miles Sanders two years ago rush for over 1,100 yards and have double-digit touchdowns. Saquon Barkley takes a hot shit on both of those guys. So to me, he's a locked top five guy. Number three, number two, number one, Joel, you, you hit it right in the head. Bijan Robinson. Listen, all three of these guys have the ceiling of being a number one, uh, being the number one RB in fantasy football. We respect CMC because, again, his legacy, his his resume speaks for itself. To me, C uh, CMC is the best fantasy option ever. I, I mean, you want to talk about efficiency. You want to talk about every single week giving you a touchdown. There's no guy that I trust more than Christian McCaffrey. If he's on the football field, you can guarantee that you're getting double digits. Brees Hall at number two. How he was able to be the number two fantasy running back last year with one of the worst offensive lines, the worst quarterback playing in the National Football League. But because he was so effective as a receiving back, let's go make sure he led the NFL at the running back position in receptions, just fell short of a thousand yards, but didn't matter. He still was uber efficient with his touches, got into the end zone nine times this past season. Now you're telling me he has one of the better offensive line, at least on paper, this upcoming season with the additions that the with the, that the Jets did make with Morgan Moses, with, of course, Tyron Smith, who, of course, we need to see if he can stay healthy. But now Aaron Rodgers, God willing, is healthy for a full season. This should be the best offense that Brees has been a part of in his young career, and he's primed to show the world that he is a top two, top three running back in the game. And Bijan Robinson, again, we know the the upside that he has as not just a rusher, but of course as a receiving back, where he did a lot of his damage this past season. And if if him and Kirk Cousins can get on the same page early on in the season, 
Bijan Robinson ceiling is the RB one this year, no doubt about it. He's had he accumulated over fourteen hundred scrimmage yards last year. Got into the end zone eight times. I'm expecting that to go up truthfully because he should be the focal point of this offense. I know Drake London. When we do our receivers list, he should be high on both of our lists. I know Kyle Pitts is going to be high on our list if we decide to do a tight ends list. This is one of the better offensive lines in football. Also, this is going to be one of the more fun teams to watch in the Atlanta Falcons. But that's going to wrap up our top five. I got Derrick Henry, Saquon Barkley, B. John Robinson, Brees Hall, and number one, of course, none other, the GOAT, Christian McCaffrey. I guess the only comment question I have, uh, you had Kyron remind me, six, seven? Seven. seven. I have six JT. So is it just injury? Is that the only thing holding you back? That's the only thing because if he is healthy for a full 17, there's no way that I can name five guys better than him. That's just the God's honest truth. But these five right here, good Lord have mercy. I, I feel so confident about these guys. Of course, barring injury. As long as they stay on the field, these guys are are primed to be elite high end options. Yeah, and this again, like these aren't all like these obviously aren't in order. Right? When you look at ADP, for example, right? Like sure. if you're in a super flex league, like Saquon Barkley is going at the two three turn, Derrick Henry is going at the back of the third round, maybe even early fourth potentially. You could get as your RB two, and he could even go as your RB one. You feel really confident about that. So yeah, obviously take these lists down. You know, give them out for free. No paywall here. This is just what we do. We're just giving back to the people. We should charge at least $10 for this, in my humble opinion. <laughs> um, but but no, this is great. I mean, what the best part about this, and if you're still listening, shout out to you. You guys should do your, your own list. Like everyone sure. out there watching, even just get your thoughts down. Because this is my first time. Like obviously we're mocking a ton. We talk about these players all the time. This is my first time, first time sitting down and like putting together the positives and negatives. Looking back at last year, looking at, the rosters this year about the, the guys they draft in free agency and, and thinking about opportunities potentially, it makes things so much easier when you're just writing down these players and trying to at least put them in order or tier them and thinking about guys potentially above them or below them. Because I mean, there's guys that we have in our top 10 that you could get in like the fifth and sixth round that you have wow. guys that are going way ahead of him that, you know, are in like our RB 18, like Josh Jacobs, for example, who's going as like a, a calm and easy uh, top 10 running back in fantasy. So if you're still listening, you obviously love fantasy football. I please just do it yourself. Write down a top 20 list, put some notes down, do some research because, you know, you could go out and you could, you could watch all the YouTube videos you want. You could buy, you know, different draft picks and whatnot. But really getting your own thoughts down makes it a lot easier when draft day comes around. I'll say this, Joe, you're 100% right. I've never made a, a top tier list for fantasy football. I kind of know my guys. I trust myself. But if we can help you guys out and, and we can kind of put our thoughts in into to video content form, obviously, if it can benefit you guys, that's a win for us. But again, Joel, like Joel said, the best advice is to trust yourself. We can give you as much advice as we can possibly as we possibly can. I like to think we know what we're talking about. But again, end of the day, you have to trust yourself. You have to go and you have to make the 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 concerted effort to to want to know your top guys but again like he said if you're listening you care about uh, care about winning and that's that's obviously at the forefront of every fantasy football season but mr dells unless you have any closing remarks that's going to do it from us over here at the fantasy reaction episode two of the 2024 nfl fantasy football season if you guys stuck around we appreciate it leave a like on this video subscribe to the pick aside channel but we will be back here giving you weekly content up until the fantasy football season where we will be dropping two episodes weekly. We drop every Thursday night, every Monday night. We go live after those games. But again, we'll talk to you guys, and we appreciate you stopping by.